Welcome to the Hawley Gallery, which opened here at Kellam Island Museum in 2010 in the former premises of Wheatman and Smith Sawmakers. Ken Hawley, over a period of 50 years, created this internationally acclaimed collection of over a 100,000 items. His aim was to tell the story of tool making, cutlery manufacture and silversmithing in Sheffield, which was gradually being lost as firms closed down or relocated, and the information and artefacts relating to these industries were being discarded and disposed of. He didn't just want the collection to be a static display of objects, but a social history, which is why, in addition to showcases with examples of the tools, there are films of craftspeople talking about their work, materials to handle, and examples of the process of making an object. The collection includes tools, the tools that made tools, catalogues, photographs and films of manufacturing processes, and the stories of the craftspeople who worked in these industries. Your way around the gallery may well depend on your own particular interests, but this guide is for those of you who would find it helpful to have a suggested route to follow, and there are several exhibits which we will invite you to touch or handle. The gallery has four main themes, starting the journey, design, making and selling. Begin your tour by following the route around to your left to hear about the man himself, Ken Hawley, and the start of the collection at A. A. Ken Hawley. From 1959 to 1989, Ken was the owner of K.W. Hawley Tools Limited, supplying tools to businesses and the do-it-yourself trade. In 1991, following an exhibition initiated by the curator of the Ruskin Gallery, Janet Barnes, the Hawley Collection Trust was formed. Initially, it was housed on Mappin Street in a university building, and in 2010, to give public gallery space, the collection was relocated here. Now move right to B. B, the A to Z temporary exhibition showcase. In the showcase here is an A to Z display of a specific type of tool, each designed to be used for a specific task and demonstrating the wide variety that have been in use. For example, previous exhibitions here have displayed hammers and planes. Here are three planes for you to handle a rounder for making ladder rungs, with an example, an old woman's tooth for making grooves across the grain, e.g. for shelving, a metal compass plane for making the concave convex sections of wooden wheel rims, with examples. Move to C. C. Metrology. The James Chesterman Showcase from 1938 displays 50 different measuring tools and draftsman's drawing instruments, including a number of precision measuring tools, from long tapes measuring 30 metres, 100 feet, to precision instruments measuring to one hundredth of a millimetre, that's one tenth of one thousandth of an inch. There is a separate metrology display in another building with a larger collection than in the Science Museum in London of precision measuring equipment. Included in the display, we have a braille micrometer made by Moore and Wright, and a braille caliper by Chestermans and Moore and Wright, a joint effort by these two companies commissioned by the Royal Society for the Blind for returning servicemen blinded in World War II. Here for you to handle a feeler gauge for determining the size of a gap and a thread gauge for determining the thread of a screw. Move to D. D, the black telephone. On this telephone, Ken describes nine different tools which are awls, chisels, a clogger knife, files, hammers, rasps, saws, trade knives and an ulu knife. If you would like to listen to one of the items, dial a number between 1 and 10. That's naught on the dial. An ulu knife is a little unusual and Ken's description can be heard on number O. The next display relates to file making. File making is one of the oldest tool making processes and dates back to Roman times. It was one of the largest industries in Sheffield in which the whole family was involved. In early times, the file teeth were cut with a specially shaped hammer and chisel at a stiddy or anvil mounted on a block of wood or stone. 
Later, machines were used with a chisel moving up and down to cut the file teeth. Here you can handle a file maker's hammer and chisels together with a bread rasp for removing the burnt undersides of loaves. If you would like to hear Ken describing the various stages in the file making process, move to E, file making. Otherwise, move on to F. F, the year knife. Here we have an elaborate construction 32 inches high in a cruciform shape with a main stem or trunk and four arms like branches jutting out halfway up made of 2,000 silver and gilt blades and miniature tools including knives, scissors, button hooks, hacksaws and corkscrews. These are fanned out at every level and the whole thing stands on an elaborate gilt base. It was created by Joseph Rogers and Sons, Sheffield Cutlers, in 1821 with 1,821 blades and the aim of adding a blade every year to mark the years of the Christian calendar. A really stunning piece of Sheffield history. Some blades have commemorated important events such as the 1953 coronation, 1966 World Cup, the Silver Jubilee in 1977 and Charles and Diana's wedding in 1981 culminating in the last blade being added to mark the millennium, bringing the total to 2,000 blades. The knife bears the motto of the Order of the Garter and is recorded in the Guinness Book of Records. Move to G. G, the materials bar. There are various examples here of materials used for the making of handles, some of which are natural, others man-made. Here on the display table, from right to left, you can handle man-made mother of pearl, in other words, nacre, and next to it, natural nacre, plastic effect horn, a square of xylonite, which is the original name for celluloid, an oblong piece of ebony, bone, and finally, antler. You can handle three examples of handles, faceted nacre with ferrule, fluted nacre, and carved ivory. Above the table on the display board, please feel free to touch a black buffalo horn and a stag antler. A little to the left, in a table display case, items include an African giraffe shin bone around 70 centimetres, that's 2 foot 4 inches long. And if you reach up above the display case, you can feel the texture and length of a white walrus tusk, approximately 61 centimetres long. Immediately to the left of this, below, on the floor, is a large rosewood log from which handles could be crafted. Above this is a mesh display wall on which you can touch more examples of material used to make handles. Find the small information board in the centre, then to the right of it, at the bottom of the wall, you will find two pieces of different coloured xylonite. Above these, a U offcut, then just above it, boxwood, centre top is bone, left and slightly below is holly, below that laburnum, and finally two more pieces of xylonite. Go round to the other side of this display to H, chisels. This place displays tools made by the Sheffield Edge Tool manufacturer Aaron Hildick, for use by woodworking tradesmen in the late 19th and early 20th century and includes chisels, gouges, mortise chisels and shoulder plane blades. Here you can examine a chisel which has been abused. A hammer, not a mallet, has been used. To the left at I is a display case of pen knives. There are 43 pen knives of varying sizes with handles made of materials including mother of pearl, bone and steel, many of which have intricate designs on them. A person who incised a design on Mother of Pearl was known as a fluter. To the left is J, cutlery knives. In this case are a selection of knives made in an era when every knife was designed for a specific purpose. A cutler made and sold knives, and the earliest reference to Sheffield and knife making is 1297. Sheffield manufacturers made a huge variety of knives, from those for building igloos to those for icing cakes. The 19 on display include a beef slicer, a lobster pick, 
an afternoon tea knife, an ivory folding fruit knife, and a bartender knife. Now move to K. K, the Amy Johnson solver. Here we have a specially commissioned original design by Mappin and Webb for a highly decorated silver solver in the shape of Australia. Present it to Amy Johnson to commemorate her solo flight to Australia in 1930. With it is a photograph of the solver, which is now part of the Amy Johnson collection at Sewerby Hall near Bridlington. Amy's route from Croydon to Darwin through 17 stopping off points, including Vienna, Aleppo, Baghdad, Karachi, Calcutta, Bangkok and Singapore, is marked in gold wire and polished stones or glass. Now move to L. Here we have a copy of Ken's shop counter. It is used for temporary exhibitions. Please ask the volunteer for information about the current display and associated handling. Now move across to M. M, the saw wall. On the left of the wall, in a glass case, are three saws made in this building by Wheatman and Smith in the last quarter of the 19th century. To the right of the glass case, are 13 examples of saws of various shapes and sizes used for widely differing purposes, from an artillery saw supplied to the army from the First World War until today, made only in Sheffield, used for cutting away branches to clear the view for guns, to an amputation saw which could remove a leg in less than one minute. Another unusual saw is a three-foot ice saw on the extreme right of the wall. Its main use is to cut spearing and fishing holes in the ice. The tip of the saw, or a regular ice auger, is used to chisel a hole big enough to get the blade started. Once started, the blade cuts quickly through the ice. Please feel free to touch the saws on the wall to get an idea of size. They have protective shields, and ask the volunteer for details if required. Here you can handle a keyhole making saw and an example of the stages involved. Cross to N. N. Scissors. There are two showcases here of scissors made in Sheffield. The top one displays nine elaborately patterned large scissors and shears awarded a gold medal at the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition. In the lower case are 35 small scissors described as fancy. They would be used, for example, for needlework and embroidery and feature exquisite patterns of flowers and leaves both in the blades and the handles or bows as they were known. A scissor put it together is a recognised Sheffield trade. Here are a pair of hairdresser's scissors to handle. Move left to O. O. Razors. Inside this display case are 12 items showing the development of razors over time, including an open razor from the 1800s, safety razors, an electric razor, a strop and a hair trimmer. Next to this is P, P, table working model. Fixed into this table are three examples of handles which show the different forces needed to make tools work. Starting on the right, the first example demonstrates push. Moving left, the second push and pull. The third, a pressure grip and turning force. Immediately left of this table on the wall is Q, Stanley Knife, where you can touch examples of the various stages in the development of the Stanley Knife. Turn the corner and immediately in front of you at R on the wall is a display of 12 handles which you can touch and decide for which tool they would be the most suitable. Now move to S. S, Sanderson Newbold Showcase. This company was a merger in 1900 between Sanderson Brothers and Company, Crucible and Alloy Steel Manufacturers from 1776, and Samuel Newbold and Company, Edge Tool Manufacturers and Saw Makers from 1735. The display includes clutch plates, a paper slitting knife, a shear blade, a planing iron, that's the cutting blade of a plane, and a rotary compressor blade. Now turn left to T. T, five craftsmen. Five craftsmen are focused on here with details of their particular skills and in small display cases, some of the tools of their trade. The first of the five men is Basil Walker, a mark maker. 
Tools and cutlery were often marked with a trademark, which was registered with the Cutlers Company, set up in 1624. To make a mark, Basil used a wide range of files and punches, knocked with a hammer and finished with engraver's tools. The display includes letter punches, needle files and engraving tools. Here are a punch and an elaborate stamp for you to handle. The other craftsmen are Bill Hookin, open razor grinder, Brian Alcock, jobbing grinder, Peter Goss, surgical instrument hand forger, and Corin Meller, creative director and designer at David Meller Design. Please ask the volunteer if you would like information about these craftsmen and the display of their tools. Also here are short films of different trades, including those of the five craftsmen where the processes involved are explored. Razor making, mark making, grinding, hand forging, fork making, saw making, auger making, saw handle making, mirror polishing, table knife cutling, pen knife cutling, sheet shear making, pearl handle making, putting together scissors, file making and boxwood rule making. You will also find a film about the collection and the collector himself, Ken W. Hawley. If you wish to hear any of the films, please ask the volunteer to press the appropriate screen. Move to the left to You, the Making of a Garden Fork. On display here are the processes involved in making the fork, starting at the top left with the blank made from a bar of steel and ending with the finished fork. Please feel free to touch the display and follow the various stages of production, going from left to right as you move down the display. Now move down to V. V. Selling overseas. Sheffield companies exported all over the world, some exporting 80 to 90 percent of their products abroad. These included Spear and Jackson, Ward and Payne, James Chesterman, Moore and Wright, George Wollstoneholm, Joseph Rogers and Swan Morton. Tea, coffee, rubber and sugar cane needed special tools such as scythes, sickles, reaping hooks, machetes, axes and knives for clearing land. Other tools exported including awls, chisels, drills, files, gimlets, hammers, micrometers, planes, rasps, saws, spokeshaves, shovels, shears, spades, scissors, surgical instruments, turn screws and wrenches, in fact any tool you can think of. The display case holds examples of exported tools including a Dutch pattern chisel made for Holland, a gold mining tape measure for South Africa and a rubber tapping knife for Malaya. Below the display case is a barrel which was used to export batches of tools such as files. To the right of the display case on the wall is a world map on which you can trace some of the destinations of Sheffield tools using the braille key below the map. Now move left again and round to the other side of this display to W. W. Giant Tools. Fixed to the wall is a giant hammer about 115 centimetres, that's 3 foot 6 inches long, which was used for exhibition or display. Please feel free to handle it. Other showcases in the collection display a wide variety of similar sized tools displayed at Beach and Ponds premises in London and at W Ponds premises in Birmingham. In one showcase near to the entrance is a set of stainless steel tools made 125 years ago by City of London Alderman Arthur Pond. There are 10 items in the collection known as the Giant's Toolbox, including a trowel, wood chisel and turn screw or screwdriver, which are also about 3 foot 6 inches, that's 115 centimetres long. That brings us to the end of our tour. I hope you've enjoyed gaining some insight into the collection, brought about through the inspiration and dedication of one man. Please don't hesitate to ask for more information about temporary exhibitions and the opportunity to handle some tools from the collection.